Okay, we read in the portion of Eichi. Eichi Yaakov Eretz Yitzrayim Shvayis Rishana. Yaakov lived in Egypt seventeen years. Eichi Yime Yaakov Shnei Chayov. And the days of Yaakov, the years of his life, Sheva Shonim Varboim Mashana, one hundred forty-seven years. So we hear Rashi cites the Chazal Loma Parshu Stuba. Why is the paragraph structure of this portion considered a sealed portion? The Vishakavan she nifta Yaakov Avinu. When Yaakov Avinu passed away, nistamu enayim believing shall be shown tzar sashibut. The eyes and the hearts of Klal Yisrael they became sealed because of the. Pain of the bondage. She schiv l'shabdom. They began enslaving them. So the sischum explains, although the bondage did not start, but because there were already illusions that they should participate in rebuilding the country, which were ultimately led to the enslavement. Therefore, this was considered. I mean, as long as Yaakov was alive, they were seen as royalty, revered at the most advanced level they wouldn't dare suggest anything that they should participate in the rebuilding of the country but once Yaakov passed away Nistvu Nistvu enabled the Michel Yisrael so there's an obvious question the order seems to be out of order why? because Chazal tell us that Lev is Chomet and the Enaim is Susuri Alev the heart lusts and the eyes are the brokers of the heart so it should say this will leave them they name shall their heart stop lusting because of the enslavement and their eyes had nothing to to seek out if there's no client there's no there's no, there's no broker there's only a broker because there's a client that has an interest so if the heart lusts the eyes are, are the broker of the heart seeking out what the heart lusts but Rashi says, citing Chazal, it's Nismu Enayim. Their eyes were sealed, and their hearts were sealed. It seems to be it's backwards. It should say the hearts were sealed because they realized they're going nowhere, and as a result of that, their eyes were sealed. There's nothing to seek out. It once mentioned in the name of the uh, Ibn Ezra, the way he explains the the negative name of Sachmut in the Aser Sadibros you should have, not have designs on your fellow's property on his wife on his livestock on his donkey whatever it may be I mean if a person has envy and has an interest how does one somehow suppress that interest it's like say a person who is jealous how does one concern that can control that how does one control it so he goes to explain so he explains it with uh but the equivalent situation, almost like an allegory, he explains that if you have a prince and his proposed prospective wife has beauty, is cultured, insightful, wise, poised, cultured, everything, the commoner does he envy the prince? There's no envy. Why is there no envy? Because a person only envies and has designed something that he believes could be his. But if a person understands something has no relevance to him, he doesn't envy that. It has no designs on it. He gives an example. Does anybody envy a bird who flies? A person is not a bird. Something that's beyond and a person understands without question is beyond your grasp. One doesn't, doesn't even consider that he has any relevance to it. As the commoner doesn't consider it has any relevance to the princess who has only relevance to the prince it's only a peer within the peer group that you believe what the other person has you have a right to therefore you actually have designs on it this envy but a person would only understand 
that whatever you get is meant to be yours and no one else's, so therefore it's beyond your reach. Regardless of what you believe. So if you, you've come to the conclusion it's not within your grasp, because it's not meant for you, it's like not envying the bird that the bird is able to fly. That's the Ibn Ezra. It needs to a man. The heart only lusts if there's a chance it's able to seek out what it can have. But if, for instance, the person's confined to in solitary confinement for the next 60 years. Does he have any, and it's without a question, he will not be released. Does he lust anything? All he has to look at is the wall which is three inches from his nose for the next 60 years. He knows that's going to be his tomb. That's that four by four cell. The heart lusts nothing. So it's not, the eyes are, are not brokering because the heart doesn't lust any longer. It's the heart, it's the eyes are sealed. Because the eyes are sealed, the heart, the heart is dead. Because there's nothing to look for. If there's nothing out there, there's nothing to broker, the heart doesn't lust any, any longer. That's the, that's the idea. The heart would lust if something's available. But if nothing's available, the heart doesn't lust any longer. Knowing since the equivalent of Din Ezra, there's nothing available to you, and because there's nothing available, so one doesn't need a broker, because you have no interest, because you've come to the to the realization that there's nothing there's nothing there. You find something interesting. We said it many times that. In the portion of Toldos, it says El Toldos, Yaakov Yosef, Ben Shvaisi Shono. So Rashi says, Mashir le Yaakov Yir le Yosef. All the happenings within Yaakov's life is there's a mirror image in Yosef's life. Yaakov, his brother hated him and vowed to kill him. Yosef's brothers hated him; they vowed to kill him. He looked like his father. He had to flee. He was sent out of, away from his home. He was sent away from his home. Many parallels between Yaakov and Yosef. He looked like his father. Many parallels. And all the trials and tribulations of Yosef were very similar to his father's. So what did that say? That ya- y- Yosef's potential was similar to the potential of his father. The role he served really went beyond his father. As we said, when Yosef was born, Yaakov was ready to leave the home of Lovan. Until then, he couldn't contend with Esau. Beis Yaakov is Esh, Beis Yosef is Lehovah. The house of Yaakov is fire, Yosef is the flame. He reaches out and consumes Esau, who's the kash, who's the equivalent of straw. That's what happens. So Yosef is the equivalent of his father. As we mentioned, Yosef was meant to father 12 tribes. Yaakov fathered 12 tribes. Yosef's children, although they were grandchildren of Yaakov, Ephraim and Asher, Guru and Shimon, as we have in this week's reading. Ephraim and Asher are the equivalent of Reuben and Shimon, the tribes. Over there in the Pasuk, in the verse, it says, when he, before he actually designates them as tribes, he says, Shnei bonecha nolodim lecho adboi mitzrayma. Your two sons who were born to you before I came to Egypt. Lehem, they should be considered mine. What does he have to give you the introduction? We know that Ephraim and Nash were born before Yaakov came to Egypt. What, is, what does he have to give you that introdu- introduction? Your two sons were born to you before I came to Egypt. What he's saying is, although Yaakov's children were born in Choron, 11 of his sons were born in Choron in the environment of Lovon. Mm-hmm. It was depraved, it was the abyss of spiritual impurity. That's what it was. And despite that, his sons were that the shift they call, that the tribes of God, they are the holiest people ever to live, the sons of Yaakov. How do you raise a family in such an environment? That nothing should seep in, no influences whatsoever. Yaakov was able to create that insular environment because of his own dimension of holiness that it negated everything, that nothing actually seeped through. Therefore, they, they were the equivalent of tribes. Yaakov had that ability to create that. How do you raise Ephraim and Asha in, in Egypt? Egypt was even, is referred to Shtufi Zima. 
they're immersed in promiscuity, there's idolatry, impurity. How do you raise such children like Ephraim and Nasha? They should be Ephraim and Nasha. That's only confirmation of who Yosef is. If Yosef is able to raise them there, that means he's the equivalent of his father. Because otherwise you can't raise an Ephraim and Nasha in Egypt. And this is what Yaakov is saying. Your two sons who mourned you in Egypt. I wasn't here. So if I wasn't here, how is it possible? The answer is, you're the equivalent of I am. Who I am. And if you are the equivalent of who I am, therefore, Ephraim and Asher, Kerubim Shimon Yuli. Therefore, I'm Asher, they assume the status of tribes as my own children assume the status of tribes. This is the dimension of Yosef. And this is why we had mentioned Yosef was taught all that Yaakov had studied was taught in Shem Be'ever. Oh, he only transmitted this Torah only to Yosef, not to the other brothers. Of course, the other brothers, even with that Torah, they didn't have the ability. They didn't have the representation of Yaakov as Yosef had that representation. Therefore, he was able to utilize that Torah to develop and perfect himself to create this wall that nothing can penetrate that wall around his family. We find that initially Yosef wanted his brothers to bring Binyamin to Egypt. And when finally Yehuda accepted responsibility, they came and he asked them, is this your younger brother? And they said, yes, this is our younger brother. So he said to them, God's grace should come upon you. Give him a blessing. So Rashi explains, why did he give him that blessing? Yochnechobini Right, God, the grace should come upon you because initially when Yaakov confronted Esau, there were only 11 sons of Yaakov born. Binyamin wasn't born yet. And Esau says to Yaakov, who are, these, who, who are these children? He says, they're the children that by God's grace I was given these children. Mm-hmm. So Yaakov blesses children with what? He says, with God's grace. Binyamin never received that bracha from his father. So because God, Binyamin never received that bracha from his father, Yosef gave the bracha. So the obvious difficulty is a person receives a bracha from the greatest, holiest man and somebody says, you know, because you didn't receive the bracha because you weren't there, I'll give you the bracha. I mean, how do you compare? It's not comparable. What is it Yosef says? Since you didn't receive the bracha before, I will give you the bracha. But ya- ya- Yosef's not Yaakov. The answer is Yosef is Yaakov. And therefore, because he is within that realm of dimension... Therefore, his brach has that degree of value. So he compensated for what Binyamin did not receive because yeah, Binyamin wasn't yet born at that time. The Balaturim and the Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar both say... Vichi Yaakov Eretz Mitzrayim Vayichi Vayichi Yaakov What were the best years of Yaakov's life? The best years was when he it says that he loved Yosef more than all his children He ben Zekudim mm-hmm. He was the most beloved of all his children because the survival of Klal Yisrael were dependent on Yosef it doesn't say because he was the son of Rachel who was the primary mat- matriarch. It's because he was Ben Zekunim. That's why he loved him. Whatever is included in that word Ben Zekunim, the wisest, he resembled him. That's why he loved him more than anyone. How old was Yosef when he sold him to slavery? He was, 14 years, he was 17 years old. And how many, the last years that he spent with him was an additional 17 years. By Echi Yaakov, what was the essence of Yaakov's life? The best years? The years he spent with Yosef, that's 34 years. Of course, the numerical value of Aichi is 34. This is the Balaturim and the Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar. Vayichi Yaakov. What was his life, Vayichi? The numerical value of Vayichi. The Orchayim HaKadosh asks, if you calculate, we know the last 17 years of his life was 17 years. What does that have to tell us? If he was 130 when he met Paro, mm-hmm. as we read last week, and he passed away at 147, 
Evidently, he spent 17 years in Egypt. So why did Thor have to introduce this portion that Yaakov lived in Egypt 17 years? So he explains, uh, or Chaim citing a verse, that everything is determined the way life pl- ends. If life ends in a very positive vein, regardless of what a person experienced there earlier, it ends in the positive. So since the last 17 years of Yaakov's life were positive, regardless of what happened pr- prior to that moment, as painful as it was, and whatever he endured, this overshadows everything. And that's what the Torah is making the point. Of course, you could figure out, make based on the calculations, when he arrived, when he passed away, he was there 17 years, but the Torah wants to tell us, that was his life. The last 17 years of his life that encapsulates his mindset, his emotion, everything else, that was the last 17 years of his life. But it's interesting. We find earlier, it says, He wanted to live in tranquility and the strife of Yosef came upon him. And Hashem says, it's not for tzaddikim that they have they're sharing the world to come. They want to even have tranquility in this world. But factually, when did that actually come to fruition? The last 17 years of Yaakov's life in Egypt. He set him in a corner in Goshen. He was separated from the Egyptians. He did not see them. And it's interesting when Yosef told his brothers to go tell his father what's going on in Egypt, who he is, he says, I want you to share with my father my power, my glory. I am the master. I am the ruler in Egypt. And I will give you a location. You, your children, your grandchildren, and all their livestock and all the possessions are going to be with me. What is he telling him? You know, you can promise a person the world, but if you can't deliver, it means nothing. I mean... Does Yaakov really care that he's the master or he's the ruler or whatever it may be? It means nothing to Yaakov. But it means a lot because he says, you and your children, grandchildren, your livestock and all your possessions will be with me. Now what guarantees he could deliver? So he says to Zod, share with your father, with our father, what you saw in Egypt. How I am the master. And because I am the master, I could deliver. So that's, that was the value of being the master and being, being the ruler. If he could deliver, that means he will be totally separated, insulated from whatever Egypt represents. All the impurities of Egypt. That, and that was what it was about. So the true tranquility that Yaakov lived this pristine, well, the only thing that was missing, he wasn't there to throw. That was the only thing that, that wasn't there. He was in Chutz Lawrence. He was outside of Eretz Yisro. There's a famous word Rabbi Yochanan had heard Rabbi Yochanan was a, was a Yerushalmi lived in, in Israel and he had heard that in Bovel in Babylon there were elderly people people lived long lives so uh, he would like was taken aback because based on the post in Kriyashma it says mm-hmm. you only have longevity in Eretz Yisrael so if that's the case, when they told them, Yesh Sabi Babovel, they're elderly people in Babovel. He says, how is it possible? It's contradictory to the, to the Pasuk. It says you will only have long days in Eretz Yisrael. So they told them that these people, they come early to the base manager's or to shul, and they stay late in shul. He says, now I understand. What did he understand? The fact it says in the Pasuk, Laman Yubi Mech, maybe the Allah Dhamma, if you're in the land. If you're elsewhere, you don't merit longevity. So what's the answer? Because they come early to shul, and they stay late in shul, and they study. So my Rishim used to say, always would say, cite a source that if you're in a location, and you study Torah, and you live within those parameters, then that is the equivalent of being an Eretz Yisrael. So Yaakov... Yaakov is what is the Merkava. Wherever Yaakov is, that's where the Shrim is. Yaakov is the Ish Yaakov is Tam Yashiv Holim. Even though he was 130 when he came to Egypt, there was the moment that he was detached from Torah. So therefore, even in Egypt, that was Shalva. He had to go because of what? Because Yosef was there. He says, I will go see my son before I pass away. But factually, that was because of what he represented, he drew Eretz Yisro all the way to Egypt. That was the level of representation.
thinking. Rav Chaim Vodoshna writes in the Nef Shachayim that in terms of the Kavona that one must have when you say Omin Yesh Mi Rabbim Vorach Lo Olam Olmei Elmayo which in Kaddish will respond the name, the great name of Hashem should be blessed Lo Olam Olmei Elmayo in all the worlds as he explains the Gemara tells us that one who responds with all and Rashi says with your full intent they forgive you you forgive them for all your sins this is without tshuva whoever heard of being forgiven without repenting even without repenting you're forgiven for your sins. But that's what the Mara says. So Rechaim Velozhin explains it this way. Firstly, just to give you some background, the Mara says, when HaKadosh Baruch, when Hashem hears, Kual Yishol answering, answering, Yesh me Rabbi Mavorach, Lo Olam Olmei Amayo, He nods his head and he says, Wait to, wo, wo to the Father, who sees his house in ruins, burnt, his sanctuary burnt and his children exiled from his table when he hears he hears his children praising him what they want it kaviyochel he not to said what is this all about so Chaim Voloshan explains it this way when a person sins what is the consequence what are the ramifications of sin we create an impure energy that impure energy, as he explains, when we speak about Gehenum, spiritual purgatory, the location where one suffers, there's no location called Gehenum. All the impurity which we create through our sins, the, that negative, impure energy attaches itself to one's soul, mm-hmm. and that suffers. It saps one's soul. And first does chuva repents before he dies it's all negated doesn't exist it's vaporized the person doesn't do tshuva so in this world Midas Arachman holds it at bay doesn't allow that energy to attach itself to the neshama because the person would not survive the person would die but once the person passes on now there's no longer Midas Arachman after one dies so then it attaches itself that's Gehenum. He explains it. Now, so every sin creates a negative energy, an impure energy. Every mitzvah creates an energy of purity. Based on the Zohar, the concept of mitzvah gereris mitzvah is the majority of that energy detaches itself, goes to the spiritual world, and there is a remnant remains with the person which draws the person to do more of the same person sins, the neg- most of the energy is detached from this existence, waiting to see what happens with the person's life. And some of it, a remnant stays behind, which is encourages them to do more. This is like an addiction. Mm-hmm. Like the foreign substance creates a craving, and that causes the person to do more of, of the same. Evil. We pray to Hashem that all the spiritual worlds including the physical world, God should manifest Himself in every one of the worlds. And by manifesting Himself in His most intense level of of presence, evil cannot coexist with God. So all those forces automatically are vaporized and negated because of God's presence permeating every level of existence. So one does not do tshuva. If a person sincerely and truly wants that God should filter and enter into every level of existence, which is la'olam olme omayi, the four levels of existence, in the general sense, then all that will be vaporized. If Yaakov is the Merkovah of the Shechina, Yaakov is that representation. Where Yaakov is, that's where the Shechina is. God's presence is. It's the Kodesh Kadoshim. It's the Holy of Holies. Egypt is irrelevant. If Yaakov is in Egypt, whatever Egypt represents has no relevance to Yaakov's parameters. 
everything is negated, voided, vaporized. So, in what kind of environment did Jacob raise 11 of his 12 children in Choron? The purest environment. In Egypt, when he came to Egypt, until he passed away, Egypt was irrelevant. It meant nothing. Therefore, the Shibut, which is oppression, which is influence, has no relevance to them. Not to him, not to his family. He was able to exude because of his level of representation that Hashem's relevance to him, that he is that domicile of the Shekhinah, therefore nothing could touch him or any, anyone who's attached to him. We find when Avraham Avinu purchased the Marsa Machpelo from, from Ephron, who was a bad man, he, uh, Ephron with the Vav deleted is Ayn Ra. He epitomized the evil eye. So it says, Vayokam hasode, Vayokam hamoro hasode, that the cave and the field and all the trees were elevated. What, what, what does it mean they were elevated? So Rashi says, according to one, Vayokam, one interpretation means it was elevated. It, it left the domain of a commoner and it entered the domain of, of, of royalty. So it was elevated. What do you mean it was elevated? Anything that's associated with the tzaddik, his assets being associated with him, they assume an elevated status. Yitzchok, although his famine years when he was in the land of Plishtim, famine years, he planted, it was a hundredfold crop. Everybody was starving, it was a famine. They said, we prefer the dung of the donkeys of Yitzchok than the gold of Avimelech. The dung of Yitzchok's donkeys produce gold and the gold of Avimelech the first thing he produces dung who ever heard of such a thing but what kind of dung is this this is associated with the Tzitzchok's donkeys it's in the physical sense maybe the same but in terms of their, it, it's innate value it's innate value is an extension of Yitzchok's Kedusha as a result of that it brings unlimited bracha and this is even the Philistines the Pelishtim they recognize this and they say we prefer that than the gold of Avimelech. But the moment Yaakov passes away, the Shechina was no longer there because the Merkov is no longer there. The domicile is no longer there. Start seeping in. As a result of this, it started to seep in. The Shibut. There was a certain degree of what? of spiritual erosion was no longer the same now it's interesting once there's the question we find that after the Chet Egel Moshe ascended to heaven again first to plead to supplicate Hashem that it should be given then he came down with Buluchos Achronos with the second set of tablets it says Koran or Ponov his face radiated. Radiated. To the point that they couldn't look at him. The Shechina was so intense. So, according to one, according to one, the Gemara, where did this radiance come from? When the Jew said, Nasev and Nishma, every Jew received two spiritual distinctions. Two crowns. One for Nasev, one for Nishma. After the Chet Egel, Hashem sent one million two hundred thousand angels to, re- to re- take back those crowns. They had to shed those crowns. Who received all those, those spiritual distinctions? Moshe. Moshe himself became that entity of Kedusha. Okay? And that was the coronal opponent. That was the radiance of his holiness. That was the original holiness of the whole, total quality show. It's interesting. I mean, Moshe was Shoko Kenegi Israel. Moshe was the queen of quality show. Now, he was the shock, he was the equivalent, but even in terms of the transfer, if he is not the equivalent of how he transfers such intense Kedusha, the answer is he has relevance. He has relevance to that, that level. Because he is equivalent. So therefore he has the capacity that you can transfer into his domain. That is the level of distinction. So seemingly there's a question. The Levim, they also forfeited their crowns. Shevet Levi did not participate in the Chet Egel, right? That's the reason why Levi are the Ephesians. That's why Aaron and his children are the Kohanim. 
initially the Bechorim, they were the Kohanim, they were the priests. After Chet Egel, they were disqualified because they were tainted with the Chet Egel. So why did Levi? If, if Levi wasn't tainted, as he definitely was not, so why did he forfeit his crowns of holiness? They should have retained it. So you say, why? Because Klal Yisrael had to forfeit it. Moshe Rabbi is also Klal Yisrael. He's also part of the Jewish people. So why did he forfeit it? Right? So you'd say, maybe he would have, except it was gifted to him. Maybe. But I was thinking, if a person lives in an environment, regards, even if you closet yourself away, you go to the Himalayas and bury yourself in a cave, living in the same existence, if the existence is tainted, you're tainted. You're affected negatively. It's impossible to avoid. Therefore, even Levi, although they didn't participate, there's no liability for Chet Egel for the Chet of idolatry, but he was minimized. Levi was minimized because they lived in this existence. Where was Moshe? Moshe was not in this existence. Moshe was in Shemaim, was in heaven. Therefore, Moshe wasn't affected as much as Nyota. Therefore, he was qualified to retain what he received and what, and even to receive the transfer of this distinction of the whole closet show into his, into his domain for that reason. Okay? Yaakov is the Shechina. He's the Merkava. When he exists, nothing. No impurity has any relevance to him or his family. What happens if he passes away? As great as Yosef and his family are, in what environment do you live? You live in an environment, the air you breathe, the location represents everything negative on the most extreme level in spirituality. There is some degree of erosion. You can't avoid it. It's not possible. That father, it's not possible erosion because everything is negated in God's presence. Because the Shechina, this is the Holy of Holies. But once the Shechina is no longer there, because Yaakov is no longer there, then it's over. Then the erosion starts. But at what level? It's at an unavoidable level. But it may be minimal. What happens when the whole generation passes away? Then, then we have problems. Then it's a slippery slope all the way down to the bottom. And that's when, that's when the bondage truly went into effect. Because the representation of Kedusha, who they were with, was no longer there for that reason. Yaakov, when he realizes his days are coming near to pass away, he summons his son Yosef. And he says to him, I want you to take an oath. I don't want to be buried in Egypt. Okay? So, of course, he more than acquiesces to his father's request, takes the oath, and he says, you will not be buried. And because Yosef was the viceroy, it was within his capacity and his ability to fulfill his request. The other brothers could, couldn't, because they were they had no power. Okay. So Rashi cites Chazal, which is the Medrash. Why didn't Yaakov want to be buried in Egypt? So Rashi offers three reasons. One reason is because ultimately he foresaw through his divine vision that one of the plagues is going to be kinim, that the earth is going to turn to lice, and there's a certain degree of pain that if his body would be in Egypt he'd be affected by that plague the other reason given is that a person is buried outside of Eretz Yisrael when it comes to resurrection they'll have to roll under through cavernous caves until they finally arrive for which is a painful process the other reason given is because if he's going to be buried there, what are they going to do? They're going to deify him. And if they deify him, as it says in Chazal, we find by the tenth plague, God says, I will judge the deities of Egypt. I will destroy them. Because since the deity is actually worshipped by the people, so the deity assumes a level of deculpability 
and the deity has to be destroyed. So Yaakov says, if I'm going to be buried here, I'll be the cause, I'll be deified. So they worship me. I don't want to have any liability. I want to be out of here. That, that's the third reason given. He wants to be out of there. Actually, as soon as he and why would they make him to a deity? Because it was known that originally the famine was supposed to be seven years. When Yaakov came to Egypt, it ceased. Why? Because he had given a bracha to Paro that whenever Paro goes down to the Nile, the water should rise. As a result of that, all the tributaries were filled with water, so all the fields were irrigated. That's where it came. So Yaakov had miraculous powers. So he would be deified. So because he'll be deified, he says, I don't want to be here because I'll be culpable for all their idolatrous behavior. Okay? That's Rashi. The Midrash cites a fourth reason. It cites the first three and cites the fourth reason. It cites a posuk, a verse in Yechezkel. Yechezkel refers to the Egyptians as Besar Chamorim Besorum. That the flesh of the Egyptians are the equivalent of the flesh of donkeys. Donkeys. And the Torah says, what happens if you have a donkey born, although it's a non kosher species, and it's the firstborn of its mother? It needs redemption. Teach them. How do you redeem the donkey? It says, Tifte Bisseh. You take a sheep, and you redeem it with a sheep, and you give the sheep to the Kohen. So Yaakov says, the Egyptian people are compared to the donkey. I am compared to the sheep. As it says in the Apostle, Seb Pizuri Yisrael. Yisrael is like the says, like the sheep. Mm-hmm. And it says, Hamor Tifte Bisseh. If I'm buried in Egypt... I'll be a redemption for the donkey. I don't want to be a redemption for the donkey. Therefore, I want to be out of here. That's, that's the Midrash. Okay? Sounds beautiful. But what does it mean? How is Yaakov being buried in Egypt, how is that a redemption of the donkey? Of the Chamor? Normally, you have, a, you have a donkey, you take a sheep, you say, this is the place of that, that's a redemption. Here, he's being buried in the ground, or wherever he's being buried, that's going to be a redemption for the donkey. What does that mean? I don't want to be a redemption for them. There's a morale. The morale frog explains. What do you mean? Chesko compares them to the donkey. I mean, they're human beings. They're not donkeys. So he explains. We know that there's 70 root nations. And 70 always connotes na- natural. The natural order. Anything beyond 7 is supernatural. Kali <coughs> shows the 71st nation. It's referred to in the words of morale, Lamalam in Ateva. We're supernatural above. We're not subject to the laws of nature. But 70 is nature. Multiples of 7. Okay, that's nature. Of the 70 nations, all nations have some relevance to spiritual. They have a spiritual capacity. The nation which has the least relevance to Kedusha, the spirituality, are the Egyptian people. And because they're nearly devoid of spirituality, therefore they have greater relevance to witchcraft, promiscuity, incest, adultery, and idolatry. More than any other nation. Because the greatest vacuum of Kedusha is Egypt. And the, the word Hamor, the root is the word Chomer. They have the most material. They have the greatest relevance to material. The Egyptians more than any other nation. Okay? That's the principle set by Morale of Prague. The way he explains, that's why Yecheskel Anovi compares them to the Chamor, the Chamorim, the donkeys. There's another Morale. He explains why did God choose Egypt as the location, as the Kura Barzel, the smelter, the smelting pot, the crucible, to make us worthy of redemption to become the Amashem. Why there more than any other place? See, quotes a medrash. The medrash says, Or min achoshech. What's Or min achoshech? The Avromi Terach. Terach is darkness. How do you extract dark, light from darkness? I mean, Terach had no relevance to any, to any of the Kedusha of Avrom. So he explains and he shows from many sources that when there's a total void, what emanates from that void is always the greatest level, the heights of Kedusha. So if Terach is Choshech, the greatest light emanates from there. So if Egypt of the 70 nations of the most devoid of Kedusha, 
the greatest Kedusha will emanate from Egypt. Therefore, Klal Yisrael's location to develop and evolve and to be the Am Hashem, to stand at Sinai, that incubation period, that process had to be in Egypt, nowhere else. And he explains the Pasuk, it says so me, it's Rhyme, Beis Yaakov, me, I'm low ace. Hoi so yhud lo kocho. Right? That was the extract. That extract was me, I'm low ace, like a foreign speaking people. And the am kocho came from there. The holiness came because they were extracted from Egypt. Okay? When one worships a deity, how does one worship a deity? Why does one worship a deity? Because if you want to get a return on your investment, you worship it, to try to figure out what the, would the deity want I should do for him, or for it. What, what would you want? Yaakov was known, he was a person who was totally negated, re- removed from anything physical. He lived a life of spirituality. They saw his family, holy people. So how would you have this power do on your behalf? Emulating this behavior. What is happening in his favor? Not being involved in the incest. Not being involved in witchcraft. Not being involved in all this other, this type of behavior. The, the depraved behavior. So what happens if they start worshipping Yaakov? What happens? They're elevating themselves. They're actually extracting themselves from the material. And they're becoming less physical. If they become less physical, what, what is the end result? Klal Yisrael is not emanating from Chomer any longer. They're less Chamorim. If the less Chamorim, this impedes and does not allow Klal Yisrael to soar to that special level. So that's what Yaakov says. The Chamor. I'm the Seth. I don't want to be their redemption. I don't want to be there. Therefore, I don't, I don't want to be deified. So it's deified not because I'm going to be culpable for their behavior of idolatry. But rather, through me, they'll be elevated and extricated from that material state. And therefore, the end result is, there's not going to be a quality trail as they should be. That's why al Nasik brain will be betraying. Just, the, the morale doesn't really, or I didn't understand, what exactly is the concept. How do you, why from the greatest void, do you extract from that the greatest entity of specialness? So I thought that maybe the, the understanding is we find what is the difference between Bria and Yitzira? Bria is creation. Yitzira is formation. Bria is ex nilo. What we call yesh mi ayin. When you're dealing with ayin, the greatest yesh comes from ayin. Creation. There was nothing. Everything came. Yitzira is formation. You have something, you put things together, you form it. You take two elements, a composite, it becomes something else. That's Yitzira. So the concept of Or bi Choshev, Choshev has no relevance to light. So what is, if Or comes from Choshev, what is that? That's a replication of creation. Kedusha from Chamor, that's a replication of Kedusha. That's a replication of creation. And factually, we did become, Mitzrayim was, was a replication of creation. This was the, the prelude, the backdrop of becoming the Am Hashem, becoming God's people, which is 71st. We became the 71st nation, which is supernatural. We were extracted, we were elevated from the physical, and we soared, we ascended to the, to the spiritual. That's what happened. Now we're able to understand, we find, that if the Yaakov passes away, he comes to Pyro and he says... My father adjured me, made me take an oath, that he doesn't want to be buried in Egypt. And therefore I'm asking you to allow me to take my father as he made me swear. Mm-hmm. What does he have to power as he made me swear? It's my father's request. It's a Rashi says Chazal that Paro knew 70 languages. As much as he tried to learn Hebrew, he could not learn Hebrew. 70, not 71. Yosef knew 71 languages. So, when Paro realized that he knew one language more than him, 71, he made him take an oath, he adjured him, that he will never ever reveal that fact. That's right. So Yosef says, 
if you want me to violate the oath that I made to my father, then I will violate the oath I made to you. And if you want, if you want me to do that, I will. Power says, no, sir, you, you do as your father, as you promised your father, to bury him in, in Canaan. So the question, the obvious question is, you know, 70 lines, 71, what's the big deal? Does it really make a difference? 70, 71. So based on Rabbi Abachi, which we once mentioned, the title of the monarch was Paro, was the name, that was the title. The w- letters Ayin Pei Reish Ofer are contained within, no, Earth, is contained within the title. What is the civilization and the belief, what is it founded on? Nothing exists outside of the material world. So that's what? That's seven. That's 70. What about if you have contained in one person 71? That means there's something beyond this world. So that's a full refutation on the foundation of Egyptian civilization. What happens to Paru? He's dethroned immediately. It clearly, irrefutably proves that it's a, it's a lie. The foundation was based on a falsehood. Therefore, Paru says, no, you can't. You can't reveal this. You will take an oath. You want me to violate my oath? Then your history. Paro is no longer a king. But that's the same idea. What is Egypt? The essence is offer. The Chamorim. Because they have the least relevance to spirituality, they're almost devoid. What, 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 what festers there? Witchcraft, idolatry, incest, adultery. Everything depraved. Everything spiritual impurity. That's what it is. That's seven. It's the totality of seven. Yosef is 71. That he, he will not reveal. But again, it's the same idea. Mm-hmm. Yaakov says, I don't want to take them out of the seven. I don't want to give them relevance to above the seven. If that's the case. But it's, it's 7D. 7D is the totality of what? Of, 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 of seven. 70. Multiples of ten. Uh, so they, of all the nations, they were the most in terms of the physical. Vayomi shavali, shavalo. So Yaakov says to Yosef, "I want you to take an oath. Swear to me." And he swore. Vayistachu Yisrael Roshamito. Yisrael, which is Yaakov, he bowed at the head of the bed. What's the bowing? What is thanking Yosef? What's the bowing? So here the Sephorno says, Vishtachu Yisrael, Lahodos Lakono, to give thanks to his maker, Tashem, Al Shechono, Lahasik Zemeisbino, that he was gracious to him, that he's able to receive this from his son, that his son would accommodate him. Okay? That was the that was the bowing. The bowing is the acknowledgement that he's giving thanks to his maker, that God was gracious to him, that his son accommodated his request. Ki'inyom, as we find, when Besuel and Lovon agreed to release Rivka to Eliezer, who was the servant of Avram and Yitzchok, it says. Vayishtachu Arzo, Lashem. He says he bowed, prostrated himself on the ground. Tashem. This is similar to that. So over there we discussed. Rashi says on the pasuk, Vayishtachu Arzo Lashem. He bowed, he prostrated him on the ground. Tashem. Bikan. From here we learn that you you give thanks on a besura tova, on a good on a, on good tidings. You hear this? You give thanks on good tidings. So we ask the question then person gives you a million dollar cashier's check do we need a pasuk to tell you that you're supposed to say thank you T- Torah goes out of its way to tell us what did Eliezer do, he bowed so here we see you have to give thanks on good tidings, of course you have to give thanks what else, what else do you give thanks so the way it was explained what does it say he just didn't say thank you he prostrated himself it's not easy. As a human being, as a physical being, to acknowledge that it's not me, it's you. A level of negation. 
to be able to fully express and recognize what the source of all brach is. And we all say, yeah, we all, we have, it's true, of course, it's God, but we also have something to do with it. If not for my initiative, if not for my personality, if not for my charisma, if not for my experience, if not for the people I know, would I really done, close the deal? It has nothing to do with the person. <laughs> nothing. But, but how do you overcome that reality that exists within a person? Even if he's humble, there's a, there's a slight trace of something. What is the gesture of total prostration on the ground? My value is no more than the dust on the earth. You have to take an over, make an overt act to negate yourself and only then do you have that sense of being the beneficiary. Once you have that sense of being the beneficiary, then you give proper thanks. That's why one has to bow when you give thanks. Because otherwise you have that level of interference. And that's what Torah says. When he heard, Vayishtachu Arzol Hashem by Eliezer. When Yaakov had this request filled by his son, Vayishtachu Yishal Rosh To give thanks to his maker, but you have to bow. Why is bowing? That's submission. When you submit, you actually, you negate yourself. Now I truly have a sense of what I've received. Because otherwise you say, you know, there's an entitlement. Whatever it is, no entitlements. No entitlements life. We find by the Bikurim that after a person makes his declaration and he recounts all the good that Hashem has done for him and this is the fruit I brought from the land that you've given me, then it says he prostrates himself in the sanctuary and he says, and he benefits from all the good that Hashem gives him. Now he can really benefit from the good that Hashem has given you because only before that prostration in the sanctuary there's, there's something I also have something to do with it you prostrate yourself you're nothing I'm nothing it's you it's not me and then you will rejoice in all the good that Hashem has given you even Yaakov as great as he is he's the Muvcha Sheba Ovos he's the Bechir Sheba Ovos he's the most special of the patriarchs he's the he's the Berkova He's the domicile for the Shechina. He's Vayishtachu. He has to bow. That's submission. And once you submit, then you really feel and appreciate. You have the capacity to process the graciousness that Hashem endows you with. Interesting. The Gemara tells us, cited in Shulchan Aruch, that one says the Shema, you're not permitted to say it lying on your back. You have to sit up. It's called Shema, and you're accepting the yoke of heaven. You know, it's like a person's on a lounge chair and he's saying the Kriya Shema. That's the way you accept the, the, the dominion of God. Who do you think you are? You say to the person, stand up and and behave yourself. Right? Well, what kind of what kind of behavior? What kind of posture is this? It's an inappropriate posture. Side is in the Rajma. When a person says Kriyashma, both feet have to be on the on the ground. You can't cross your legs. You know, some people you see the way they daven. You know, they cross the legs. You see their 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 fancy colored tricolored socks with their seven hundred dollar pairs of shoes. Who do you think you are? What do you have feet? What do you have a brain? Why why do you even function? It's only because Hashem wills you, you your existence. It has to be with a reverence. Lying on your back, it's inappropriate. It's not a proper posture. It has to be in a respectful posture. But that's accepting. We're not talking about negating yourself to give thanks. That's accepting who, who the king is. Whose dominion am I accepting? What are you willing to do? To what degree are you committed to him? 